Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The top stories that we're tracking for you this evening. The Lal Street sees a 13-day of gains, the longest winning streak. The Nifty marking its longest winning streak on record, but the gains are limited as bulls consolidate at record levels. There are no checks and balances in the SME public markets as a whole time member at Sebi Ashwini Bhatia warns investors about the IPO frenzy, calls on bankers to reject sketchy IPO applications. The union government has initiated preliminary discussions with the RBI and SEBI for amending rules to allow the creation of sovereign wealth funds. Sources say a $5 billion fund can create $10 billion investment opportunities every year. That's an exclusive. The union cabinet clears seven schemes to bolster the agriculture sector with an outlay of nearly 14,000 crore rupees. Also clears a proposal from Kane Semicon to set up a plant in Gujarat with an investment of 3,300 crore rupees. The board of Gujarat Gas approves a scheme that will allow three group entities to merge with itself. The company says the restructuring will simplify the holding structure, enhance synergy and unlock value for shareholders. Gujarat Gas and Gujarat State Petronet shares rally in trade. The Congress party levels fresh conflict of interest allegations against SEBI chief Madhavi Puri Butch accuses her of drawing a remuneration worth nearly 17 crore rupees from ICICI Bank while being employed with the market regulator. ICICI Bank says it has not paid any salary or granted ESOPs to Butch after her retirement other than her retiral benefits and all payments had accrued to her during her employment phase with the ICICI group. Heavy rains batter Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. At least 27 people have been killed. Over 17,000 people have been evacuated as incessant rains lead to widespread flooding. Train services impacted across the two states. Schools and colleges remain shut in Hyderabad. The Supreme Court decides to intervene against state governments deploying bulldozers to demolish properties of accused person. Ask how can a house be demolished even if the person is convicted? Calls for pan-India guidelines to streamline bulldozer demolitions. The Supreme Court grants bail to former Ahmadmi Party functionary Vijay Nair in an alleged money laundering case. The top court also grants bail to Delhi's Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal's aide Bibhav Kumar over the alleged assault on the Raj Sabha MP Swati Maliwal. On the other hand, the Enforcement Directorate arrests AAP MLA Amanatullah Khan in connection with an alleged money laundering case. Schools, offices and Israel's largest airport shut after a one-day strike, but union's nationwide anger simmers over the death of six hostages and failed ceasefire talks. The Israeli army continues to bomb Gaza, killing 11 people who were sheltering at a school. The government summons the content head of Netflix over web series IC814 on the hijacking of the Indian Airlines flight to Kandahar by a terrorist group. The centre is likely to seek an explanation over the representation of the terrorists in the series. India wins a second gold medal at the Paralympics. Nitish Kumar clinches gold in the Meds Badminton Singles SL3 category. India has won nine medals so far. Well, let's start with the market action for the day. The gains were limited, but records continue to tumble. The Sensex and the Nifty ending at a record high for the fifth straight session. This was also the 13th straight session of gains. For the markets, this is the longest winning streak on record, but bulls did consolidate at record levels. The Sensex gained 194 points. The Nifty added about 40 points. The mid-caps did underperform in trade today, but that was the market snapshot for you. Market regulator SEBI has tightened the eligibility norms for stocks in the futures and options segment. Now, the new rules will triple the minimum medium quarter Sigma order size and the market-wide position limit. Brokerage firm Nuama says that the updated criteria could lead to the exclusion of 18 stocks like Abbott India, Granules India and Metropolis. They're likely to be excluded. On the other hand, stocks like Geo Financial, Zomato, Avenue Supermart, Mazagon Dock, Cochin Shipyard and others are likely to be included in the FNO segment. A quick wrap of the commodity market action tonight. Oil prices extending losses due to expectations of higher production amid sluggish demand. This after reports that OPEC countries and allies are set to proceed with a planned oil output hike from October. This along with sluggish demand in China and the US has outweighed a sharp drop in output from Libya. Gold prices dipping as the dollar closed in on a two-week high. Expectations of a rate cut from the US Fed in September have also pushed prices lower. 
Now, there are no checks and balances in the SME public market, and that's the tough talking from Ashwini Bhatia, a whole time member at the market regulator SEBI. Speaking at a CI event in the, uh, Mumbai, Bhatia said bankers should learn to say no to IPO applicants. These listings by smaller companies are governed by stock exchanges themselves and not SEBI. Now, more than 14,000 crore rupees have been raised through the SME IPO market, including 6,000 crore rupees, which was raised last year. SEBI is Bhatia warning that investors in the SME IPO market should tread with caution. The checks and balances are simply not there. Nobody is actually saying no to the applicants. When we were bankers, we actually many times said no to a customer. Maybe the diligence that is required of the chartered accountants, merchant bankers, and exchanges is possibly missing, and they need to do some hard work over there. Please be good doctors to these companies. Don't give them steroids when they can survive on paracetamol. Well, that's a reiteration of caution coming in there from a SEBI whole time member, Ashwini Bhatia, with respect to the frenzy that is currently underway in the SME market. Now, India's manufacturing activity has slowed to a three-month low for the month of August, but it did expand for the 30th consecutive month since July of 2021. The HSBC Purchasing Managers Index for the month stood at 57.5 versus 58.1 in July, and this drop was largely led by softening demand, slow growth in new factory orders, and weaker economic. Exports are reading below 50 denotes contraction and above 50 signifies expansion so well in expansionary territory. In the auto space, two-wheelers accelerated in August, reporting a double-digit growth across the board. TVS, Hero Motor and Bajaj all reporting better than estimated sales. Passenger vehicle sales outperformed commercial vehicles in the four-wheeler segment. Now, the cabinet has approved seven schemes worth about 14,000 crore rupees for the agriculture sector. Union Minister Ashwini Veshna made the announcements after the meeting of the union cabinet chaired by Prime Minister Modi. One of the schemes is the Digital Agriculture Mission with an outlay of over 2,800 crore rupees. The aim is to have a digital public infrastructure for the agri sector and cover all farmers with digital IDs by FY27. Digital Agriculture Mission basically जो DPI का स्ट्रक्चर है, डिजिटल पब्लिक इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर का स्ट्रक्चर है, उसी आधार पे एग्रीकल्चर के लिए इसका डेवलपमेंट किया जा रहा है। Well, we are talking about the use of technology or harnessing technology for the Indian agriculture sector, and within that, the India agriculture, uh, the India Agri Stack that has been okayed by the cabinet, uh, you know, contains two very important pillars. One, of course, is the creation of new digital IDs for farmers across the country, and this would be something on the lines of an Aadhaar. So this is going to be like a Kisan ki pehchan, and these digital IDs are going to be linked to all the demography details, family details, land ownership details, livestock ownership details. Uh, the kind of benef the kind of schemes that they are uh, availing, uh, you know, uh, the use of fertilizers, and equally important would be the kind of crops that they're sowing every season, and that is also going to be captured uh, through a survey that is going to be mobile app based. Both of them put together over the next two to three years, probably you're looking at a new face of the Indian agriculture sector. Uh, in terms of the digital ID that I'm talking about, well, the aim here is to do it by FY27 to link all 11 crore farmers with these new digital IDs so that, you know, all the other uh, aspects of linkage that I'm talking about, that's going to unfold. Similarly, to also create a registry of crops sown. Uh, because, uh, you know, we are in the midst of climate change, a lot of other challenges that we need to look at. Uh, the government is also trying to, you know, make sure that there are certain benefits that the farmers are able to get and, you know, vis -a -vis, uh, also in terms, both ways, also in terms of decision making. It becomes easier for the government to take important decisions for the agri-sector because there is that much more data and information that's reliable, that's available. Having said that, uh, the centre is already in conversation with at least 19 odd states, some MOUs have already been inked and going forward, this is going to only increase. Uh, even the crop sown registry that we're talking about, I think probably by FR26, the government aims to cover all the districts within the country. All right, Sapna, many thanks.
thanks for joining us. And that's not all. The Cabinet also approved the proposal of a semiconductor company, Kane Semicon, to set up a plant in Sanand in Gujarat. This will be India's fifth semiconductor unit with an investment outlay of 3,300 crore rupees. The proposed unit will produce nearly 60 lakh chips a day. The semiconductors produced will cater to multiple segments, including automotive, electric vehicles and consumer electronics. Now, the Reserve Bank has said that 97.96% of the 2,000 rupee banknotes have returned to the banking system. Only 7,200 crore rupees worth of the withdrawn notes are still with the public. The total value of 2,000 rupee notes in circulation when the denomination was first withdrawn stood at 3.56 lakh crores. The Board of Vedanta has approved the third interim dividend of 20 rupees a share for FY25. The total dividend payout for the company will amount to 7,821 crore rupees. The record date for the payment has been set for the 10th of September. The mining giant has already announced two interim dividends with fiscal worth over 5,000. 600 crore rupees. Now, here's the latest on one of India's largest crypto exchanges, Vazirex. It's now said that 43% of customer funds lost in a suspected cyber attack are unlikely to be recovered. In a virtual press conference, the exchange announced that it's undergoing a restructuring process, which could take up to six months. They also are in discussions with a potential white knight to inject funds and explore partnerships. Now, shares of Gujarat gas zooming in trade after the board approved a restructuring scheme. The scheme proposes a merger of GSPC, Gujarat State Petronet, and GSP Energy into Gujarat gas. The company's gas transmission business will be carved out and be listed as GSPL Transmission. Nimesh, who broke that story first on CNBC TV 18, joins us now with the details. Nimesh. Over the weekend, Gujarat-based gas companies GSPC, Gujarat Gas, as well as GSPL approved the restructuring scheme which proposes to merge the three entities to simplify the holding structure and to unlock value for investors. The entire scheme of arrangement will be done in, th in, the, in three steps. One, GSPC will be merged into Gujarat Gas. Second step, Gujar GSPL will be merged into Gujarat Gas. And third, GTL will be uh, removed separately and list uh, after the merger of these businesses. Now, as far as GSPC merger of uh, merger into Gujarat Gas is concerned, uh, the ratio is going to be 10 shares of Gujarat Gas for 305 shares of GSPC. Uh, the second step would be merger of GSPL into, G, uh, into Gujarat Gas, wherein uh, Gujarat Gas, uh, the 10 shares of Gujarat Gas for every 13 shares of GSPL. And the third is going to be GTL, which will be demerged and list separately. There, there will be one share of GTL for three shares of Gujarat Gas. This is the scheme of arrangement. Now, essentially, this has been done to simplify the holding structure. What is the existing structure? Gujarat government owns close to 55.5% in GSPC, which is unlisted. Now, GSPC in turn owns close to 37% in GSPL. And GSPL in turn owns close to 54% in Gujarat Gas. This is the existing structure. It will change after the, after the demerger process. How it will look like? First company will be Gujarat Gas. Now, in Gujarat Gas, there will be city gas distribution business, gas trading, ENP in the renewables business, and the related investments. This will be one entity. The second entity will be GTL. Now, GTL will, will have the gas transmission business, which will be demerged from GSPL, and the related investments will also be into GTL. So that's the structure, how it will look like. Brokerage seems to be quite bullish on, on, the, on the merger announcement. So Antic has actually raised the target price in Gujarat Gas to 726. They believe that the merger is value accretive from day one itself. Even Equirus today has, has upgraded uh, Gujarat Gas to an ad. They have a target price of 667. They believe that it's a well-thought uh, merger and will benefit uh, Gujarat Gas to become the second largest gas trading company in India after Gale India. However, there are some skeptics as well. So Jeffries actually has an underperformed rating with a target price of 450. They believe that while the integration of GSPC's gas business, trading business, will improve the gas ma Gujarat gas margins profile, however, earnings volatility will rise, implying a lower valuation multiple as far as Gujarat gas is concerned. So uh, essentially, as I said, you know, the whole entire restructuring has been done to simplify the holding structure as well as value unlock in GSPL. All right, Nimesh, many thanks for joining us. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive tonight. The union government has initiated preliminary discussions with the RBI and SEBI to amend rules to allow the creation of a sovereign wealth fund. Dozens of nations, including China, Japan, Norway and the UK, have federal sovereign wealth funds that invest in assets across the world. The US does not have a federal fund, but several states in the US do have similar funds. Parikshit is standing by with more Parikshit. Uh, where are the talks on this sovereign wealth fund idea? What can we expect and how soon? Well, the central government is considering the idea of a sovereign wealth fund. CNBC TV 18 has learned from sources that preliminary discussions have been held with RBI, SEBI 
uh, and also give city officials about the possibility of setting up such a fund. The government recently sought views of over 30 PSUs about the possibility of success of such a fund. Officials privy to discussion say that government is considering a fund which can invest abroad via PPP mode. Sources aware of the government's uh, thinking say that a sovereign wealth fund would boost India's capability to invest in infrastructure projects abroad in countries uh, in Africa, for example. The government is considering whether a sovereign wealth fund would give India more leverage to support friendly countries and allies than lines of credit and grants in aid. As per initial discussions, a $5 billion fund could create $10 billion worth of investment opportunities annually. At the moment, discussions are at an early stage and the government has yet to formalize a view. But we've got views from uh, market experts such as Nilesh Shah, the managing director of Kotak Mahindra Asset Management. He told us that the time has come for India to generate market return on its investment. Singapore, Nordic, Middle Eastern countries have shown how to manage wealth. We have to build on the good work uh, done by regulators in conserving and creating values. We are batting like pre-90 cricket team. First save the match, then aim for a win. We need to play like today's cricket team and go for the win. All right, uh, Parikshit, many thanks for joining us. That's a CNBC TV 18 exclusive tonight. Now, the Congress party has levelled fresh allegations against SEBI chief Madhubi Puri Butch. Congress spokesperson Pavan Khera accused her of conflict of interest by drawing a remuneration worth nearly 17 crore rupees from ICICI Bank while she was employed with the market regulator. Khera says that several probes on ICICI Bank were being adjudicated while Butch was receiving income from the group. The Congress has called this a serious breach of ethics and accountability in public service. Kerr also questioned the integrity of SEBI, stating that the market regulator should maintain impartiality and independence. Meanwhile, ICICI Bank has responded to the charges levelled by the Congress against the SEBI chief. In a statement, the bank said it has not paid any salary or granted ESOPs to the SEBI chief after her retirement, other than her retiral benefits. ICICI Bank's statement also said that all payments had accrued to Madhavi Puri Butch during her employment phase with the ICICI group. SEBI ki chairperson, jab wo member thi, whole time member thi, 2017 से 2024 के बीच में रेगुलर इनकम आईसीआईसीआई आई बैंक से ले रही थी 16 करोड़ 80 लाख ये सीधे सीधे सेक्शन 54 सेक्शन 54 ऑफ सेबी जो एम्प्लॉय सर्विस रेगुलेशन 2001 मैं इसका एनेक्शन आपको दिखाऊंगा उसका वायलेशन है सीधे सीधे ऑफिस ऑफ प्रॉफिट का मामला है सीधा इसमें अगर किसी में थोड़ी सी थोड़ी सी भी अगर लिहाज शर्म लज्जा कुछ हो वो इस्तीफा देगा एक मिनट नहीं रुकेगा इस एक्सपोजर के वेल दैट्स द कांग्रेस पार्टी मेकिंग एलिगेशंस अगेंस्ट द सेबी चीफ एंड आईसीआईसीआई बैंक रिस्पोंडिंग डिसमिसिंग दोस चार्जेस द सेबी चीफ मीनवाइल एड्रेस्ड एन इवेंट बाय इंडस्ट्री बॉडी सीआईआई इन मुंबई टुडे शी स्टॉप्ड शॉर्ट ऑफ टॉकिंग अबाउट रियल एस्टेट इन्वेस्टमेंट ट्रस्ट और रीड सेइंग दैट इफ शी utters the mere word she will be accused of conflict of interest now last week while speaking at the global fintech fest the sebi chief had said she received positive feedback from industry on the launch of small and medium reits last month us based short seller hindenburg had accused the sebi chief of conflict of interest in approving a reit backed by blackstone where her husband was employed as an advisor butch and her husband have denied all charges made by hindenburg here's the sebi chief from this morning this is all simple stuff that technology will enable. Uh, of course, there was a mention of REITs, but Ajkal, if I utter the word REITs, I am accused of conflict of interest. So perhaps it would be better for me to abstain. Uh, but indeed, you know, these are the emerging asset classes in our country. Globally, they are large, strong. Uh, they monetize a lot of the group build out of the infrastructure of the country. They have a huge uh, you know, uh, multiplier effect in terms of the growth of the country. So all of this is very much on our agenda and it will be done in a manner of co-creation because that's the only sensible way to do it. Well, that's the SEBI chief there. Time for us to head into a break. But up next, the Supreme Court decides to intervene against state governments deploying bulldozers to demolish properties. That and more when we return.
The latest in international news, thousands of Israeli citizens took to the streets demanding a ceasefire deal to end the hostage situation in Gaza. Protesters clashed with security forces yesterday in what has been one of the largest anti-government demonstrations since the Gaza war began 11 months ago. There is widespread anger against the Netanyahu government over the death of six hostages and failed ceasefire talks. The nation's largest trade union has called for a general strike today. Meanwhile, Israeli army continues to pound Gaza. Dozens of Palestinians, including 11, were who were taking shelter in a school were killed. And back home, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana grappling with heavy rains and floods for the second day. At least 27 people across both states have been killed in rain-related incidents. 26 national disaster response teams have been deployed for flood relief and rescue operations. The Telangana government has stepped up relief measures after at least 15 people were killed. Affected people have been moved to relief camps in the state. Now, the Supreme Court has come down heavily against the practice of what has colloquially come to be known as bulldozer justice, a phenomenon across several states against people accused of crime. The apex court, while hearing a plea seeking directions against the practice, asked how can a house be demolished even if the person is convicted. Ashmit joins us now with details. Ashmit, take us through the court's observations and the implications. Well, over the last few months and years, we've seen many headlines of bulldozers, of JCBs being deployed to demolish houses. And in many of those cases, the persons whose houses were demolished happened to be people who were in conflict with the law, who were in conflict uh, with uh, the state. And that is something that was called out in the Supreme Court to be a form of strong arm justice or to be a form of retributive justice. This, the petitioners argued before the Apex Court, is simply not tenable, is simply not permissible under the constitutional framework that we have in India. What's important, however, is that these questions were raised way back in 2023. For 12 months, there's been no hearing in this matter. Finally, the matter got taken up today. Uh, the Apex Court uh, expressing some tough questions, expressing some concerns, rather, uh, with respect to the conduct of this bulldozer justice, this strong-arm justice. Uh, the Apex Court observed that even in cases where the son is believed to be recalcitrant uh, as compared to the father, the father cannot be made to pay uh, in terms of demolishing his house. Also going on to say that there is no provision in law which provides for demolition of a house in case a person is accused of being violation of the law, uh, even in case he's convicted even in that situation, there is no case made out for demolition. And finally, saying that given that this uh, trend appears to have traveled beyond just UP, traveled to states like MP Rajasthan, which was flagged uh, by the petitioners, that this is being seen across various states, then here the Apex Court decided to intervene and said that there is a need for pan-India guidelines to ensure uh, that this uh, demolition justice that is done is in keeping with the municipal laws, is not in breach of those provisions, and that there is uh, the lacuna is not exploited by the state uh, to target a particular community or a particular person. So strong words falling from the Apex Court, seeking answers from the centre. The hearing will resume on September 17th. That's next week. Ashwit Penny, thanks. And staying with news from the Supreme Court, it's formed a high-level committee to resolve the grievances of protesting farmers at the Shambhu border. The Apex Court has said the committee will convene its first meeting this week and has been asked to identify the key issues that need to be addressed. The Supreme Court has granted bail to former Admanmi Party functionary Vijay Nair in an alleged money laundering case related to the Delhi excise policy probe. The court, while granting Nair bail, said that he had spent 23 months in jail and the enforcement directorate has been unable to complete a trial on time despite its assurances. The court clarified that the right to liberty has to be respected even in a case of stringent laws like the PMLA. And the Delhi Chief Minister's uh, aide, Bibhav Kumar, who was arrested for the alleged assault of the AAP Rajya Sabha MP Swati Maliwal, has also been granted bail by the Supreme Court. The Apex Court noted that Kumar had been in judicial custody for 100 days and a charge sheet had been filed. It also said that the conclusion of the trial will take time as there are more than 51 witnesses to be examined. But while two AAP associates have been given bail, the Enforcement Directorate has arrested AAP MLA Amanatullah Khan in connection with an alleged money laundering case. The case is related to the financial irregularities pertaining to the Delhi Waqf Board. Khan was taken into custody under the provisions of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act after the agency conducted a search at his residence in Delhi around 6.30 a.m. in the morning. The Amadi Party has termed this a false case, adding that more the BJP attempts to suppress the Amadi Party's voice, the more vocal it will become.
Now, the government has summoned the content head of Netflix over web series IC814, which is based on the hijacking of an Indian Airlines flight by a terrorist group in 1999. The centre is also likely to seek an explanation of the representation of terrorists in the series. The series has been adapted from the book Flight into Fear, the captain story, which has been authored by Captain Devi Sharan, the pilot of that flight. Now, IKEA does not want its plans for India to remain confined only to furniture. The Swedish retail giant is also planning to foray into sleep solution, fitness and design inspiration to provide Indians a holistic experience when it comes to life at home. Zina Barria gets us a sneak peek. Swedish home furnishing retailer IKEA launched a slew of new offerings across its home and food categories, also foraying into pet products. The idea, IKEA says, is to have a holistic approach to life at home. We know many Indians suffer from not enough sleep or not good sleep. Right. And our view on sleep is much more than the mattress. And you spend, uh, should spend uh, a third of your life actually sleeping. So it's such a essential thing. And yeah. then we have learned when we have explored it deeply that the mattress is important, the comfort, how you sleep, right. the pillow, of course. But there are other elements that also create the better sleep. And that is the solutions that we are showing here today. Can you tell us what is uh, the revenue boost that IKEA India would have by launching this collection? A big share of uh, what we sell is around the bedroom. We know it's very, uh, a very important part of the home and many Indians want to improve the bedroom and their sleep. So we have big hopes that this will get many more Indians and many more happy customers to try out the full solution of how to create a better sleep and a better bedroom by looking at it more holistically beyond just the bed and the mattress. IKEA has also joined the AI bandwagon with the integration of AI not just into its manufacturing processes but also on its app to enhance the shopping experience for consumers and to make it more personalized. AI is a newer phenomenon and now we are trying to create tools that are um, helping the customer to plan their home. And that is something that is, of course, new. Um, Can you tell us up. about these tools? Yeah, there is a new tool, uh, as of now, uh, called Creative. And okay. that helps you to design your own room. So you can scan it, and it's in the IKEA app. Mm -hmm. And you can then uh, take away the furniture you don't want and can uh, recycle or give away. And then put in IKEA furniture, you can paint the walls, and you can see what it actually would look like and then you can easily order if you would oh, like wow, to have the great. product. So that's going to facilitate very much uh, the planning of your home. That's great. Also, you know, uh, we've recently known about the fact that uh, IKEA has moved into a pet collection. Can you yeah. tell us and elaborate on that? Yeah. So uh, over the years, we have uh, always said uh, that we are having all everything you need for your home mm -hmm. then uh, and the family and mm -hmm. then the question comes uh, are pets part of the family and we say yes and that's why we also now have collections for the pets right. we know that the dog and the cat is an important family member so we are happy to launch it here in india now IKEA has also spruced up its food menu and has launched a limited edition home furnishing range to cash in on the upcoming festive season. These moves, it hopes, will draw more consumers to not just its stores, but also to shop from its app. In Mumbai, Zinia Barya. And before we wrap, India is going strong at the Paris Paralympics, bagging a second gold medal on day five. This takes India's total medal tally to nine. Shatla Nitish Kumar won the second gold for India in the men's badminton singles SL3 category. Kumar is an IIT graduate who produced a brilliant performance, winning the match in three games. Earlier, Indian shooter Avni Lekhara clinched the first gold for this season in the women's 10-meter air rifle event. This is her second consecutive win. Other winners on the fifth day, you Yogesh Kathunya winning silver for hurling the discus to 42.22 meters in his first attempt. Another treat for the country was Priti Pal's win, who scripted history by winning two medals at the Paris Paralympics over the weekend. Meanwhile, it was the 17-year-old Sheetal Devi who amazed the audience after the armless shooter hit the bullseye in her first attempt. However, she lost the match eventually. But what a great victory it has been 
for all the Paralympians. And with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. Thanks very much for watching the news. We'll continue right here on CNBC TV 18. Do stay tuned. We're back in a moment.